welcome everybody to another lecture of our Elements of Sustainability series. Today we have a really interesting topic on climate change, how to tackle a wicked problem, uh, presented by Dr. Daniel Bernier. Dr. Bernier directs Duke University's Center for Energy Development and the Global Environment, which is an initiative that harnesses the power of businesses to meet the global demand for energy, resources, and improve quality of life. He is the founder of the Global Water Challenge, is the co-author of the CEO Water Mandate, and he leads, uh, he's a lead contributor to the policy documents issue through the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and the United Nations Foundation. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce you, Dr. Vermeer. The floor is yours. Thanks, Erica, uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also to the Herb Institute and um, all of the people who have helped to um, put this webinar series together. I'm really happy to be here. It's an honor to share my ideas about climate change and its relevance to business, a topic that I've been passionate about for many, many years and one that I think will have profound uh, impacts on our companies, our economies, our lifestyles, and future generations. So let's begin. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more background on my own personal story so that you can understand uh, the way that I'd like to approach the issue of climate change. As Erica mentioned, I was with the Coca-Cola Company where I led the Global Water Sustainability Initiative back in the early 2000s. When we started that work, I was in a, the company's strategy think tank, and when we began to work on water, because we were in the think tank, we had a chance to really explore deeply uh, not just the operational related uh, issues related to water, like uh, water efficiency or wastewater treatment, but understood how critical water is to everything we care about, ecosystems, public health, food supply, women's rights. And by approaching uh, the issue uh, in a much more broad, holistic way, we we're able to open up all kinds of new uh, opportunities for the company to engage with partners and be part of the solution to water problems instead of part of the problem. Uh, about 10 years ago, I came to Duke, where I launched the Center for Energy Development in the Global Environment, uh, where we work with companies to, in order to rethink and reimagine how uh, companies might approach uh, urgent social and environmental issues in ways that uh, help to take on those grand challenges, but also provide value in reducing risks and creating economic opportunities for the company. And finally, I just uh, want to highlight that last week we held the first ever Climate Cap Summit, which is referenced in the, the bottom right of, of the slide. We brought together 150 MBA students from uh, 16 universities around the country to hear from about 50 executives that were working on climate change in business relevant ways, in finance, in food and ag, in construction, in insurance, and in other, many other sectors of the economy. And so this is a topic that's really top of mind for me and one that um, hopefully helps you understand um, the relevance of this issue and what action you might be able to take on climate issues. So climate change is uh, overwhelming, no doubt about it. It's complex, it's global, it has uh, very long timelines, diverse impacts, scientific complexity. So one way to approach the topic of climate change is to see how it takes shape in a specific local context. So I just want to highlight in Thailand in 2011, there were massive rains that began in the north of the country, gradually moving their way across the central uh, part of the country and ending up in Bangkok creating some of the worst floods in the history of both Thailand and even of the world. These floods killed more than 500 people, affecting more than 12 million other people uh, and disrupting business at some of the uh, planet's biggest industrial parks. So, for example, Hanna Microelectronics, which is a key supplier of sensors and chips for Apple's iPhone, had a plant that was deluged by the, uh, by the floods. After the storms, Apple was so concerned about this that they offered helicopters to airlift the 100 million chips out of the factory so that they could be um, used and not ruined. 
The government dispatched the Thai Navy to ferry about 450 pieces of heavy machinery to an alternative factory so that manufacturing could resume. In fact, I heard stories of divers that w had to go into the facility and dive down to take out uh, drill bits and other pieces of equipment which were unique to the plant and found nowhere else in the world. So I think what this signals is w that issues like climate change can take very local form, but they can have global consequences because of the global supply chains and the ways that these systems are linked together and have very specific kind of vulnerabilities depending on uh, the role that each of these suppliers plays in the broader global system. So just a few quick reflections that foreshadow what I'd like to talk about today. First of all, I think climate change really is not something that we think about only in the future, but it's very much present now. That local events can have complex consequences, especially for companies that have complex supply chains. And that climate change, as it moves from being unpredictable to chronic, is shifting the discussion from environment to economy, from politics to business, from tragedy to risk, and from altruism to opportunity. So the outline of what I'd like to cover today um, are these seven points. I'd like to share with you the idea of wicked problems and uh, in what ways climate change is a wicked problem. I'll give a little bit of a 101 on, clim on the climate system and evidence of a changing climate. We'll talk about the societal costs and impacts. And then what are the business actions, risks, and opportunities uh, that make sense given the urgent challenge? what investors' perspectives and business leadership is on the issue, and then finally highlight some of the wicked problem tools that can be brought to bear in rethinking this issue in new ways. And then I'll conclude. So what is a wicked problem? The formal definition, and this is not just my term, this is a term that's actually been in the literature for over 40 years, is a particular kind of problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of its systematic complexity, unclear and evolving requirements, and resistance to resolution. So whereas, you know, you can face very complicated problems in a chess game or in many engineering uh, domains, those problems have clear solutions. They may be complex, but not at the systemic level. It's clear what it mean, means to solve the problem, and then move on to other problems. Wicked problems, by contrast, are anything but. So I'm thinking here of issues like obesity, like ocean waste, like urban poverty, and like the Ebola crisis. These problems have unique characteristics that make them particularly difficult to solve and require very different kinds of tools to be able to approach them in new creative ways that, if not be able to solve them, be, to be able to substantially impact them and inflect them in a positive direction. So formally, what is a wicked problem? It's these eight characteristics, difficult to define and to bound. There are multiple causes and they are interdependent. Every wicked problem is unique, so standardized approaches tend to be pretty ineffective. Solutions are partial, unpredictable, and unsatisfactory. Every cause is also an effect, meaning that each solution that's attempted often is then becomes part of the problem. So if you think about urban poverty, to be able to address that problem, you need to understand more than just urban poverty, but also all of the welfare attempts that have been taken on over the several decades, those now become part of the problem itself. Impacts and responses are socially complex and unstable across space and time, so very hard to locate and identify the stakeholders. Policy responses often are very difficult and fail and cross governance boundaries in many cases. Progress requires large scale and sustained behavior change. Any of you who have tried to stay on a diet know how difficult that can be. And it may be hard or impossible to agree on the metrics of success. Some follow-on work also specified that for problems like climate change, they're really super wicked problems and that time is running out. Those who cause the problem also are trying to s solve the problem, that uh, there's very weak central authority and that our discounting 
uh, of investments makes it very hard to make investments that only pay off in the long term. So we irrationally discount. So this is the definition of wicked problems. Let's turn our attention now to the nature of the climate system. I think to be able to understand climate change, uh, it's critical that you understand some basics about the climate system. So I'd like to lay out some of those uh, elements now. So what is climate? Climate is the mean and variability of variables like temperature, precipitation, and wind over a period of time. So the World Meteorological Organization typically would say within a kind of 30-year window. So the, the, the average uh, mean and variability of these temperature, precipitation, and wind uh, indicators over time is what defines a climate. The climate system is made up of several subcomponents. So those include the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, land surface, and the biosphere. And you can think of things like the sun, which is really outside our climate system, as well as the effect of humans as being external forcing on that climate system. So let's talk about each of those elements in a bit more detail. Atmosphere is the most unstable and rapidly changing part of the climate system. So the atmosphere is made up mostly of nitrogen, about 78%, along with about 21% of oxygen and 1% of argon. Uh, and that these have very limited interaction with solar radiation, either coming through the atmosphere or being radiated back out. However, there are a number of trace, what are called greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone, which absorb and emit radiation. These are less than 0.1% by volume, but they play a critical role in the Earth's energy budget. In addition to these um, trace greenhouse gases, water vapor also plays a really important role and can be considered a greenhouse gas. So let's talk about um, the other elements of the system briefly. The hydrosphere is the liquid and sur uh, liquid surface and subsurface water, both fresh and saline, uh, on the planet. So we are a watery planet covering 70% of the Earth's surface. Uh, water stores and transports large amounts of energy and stores uh, and dissolves large amounts of carbon dioxide. In this sense, it's a kind of damper on uh, temperature, keeping it stable despite fluctuations in other aspects of the system. So it can be considered a kind of regulator of the Earth's cl climate. The cryosphere are the ice sheets, glaciers, snow fields, sea ice, and permafrost. The most important characteristic of the cryosphere is the extent to which it's reflective uh, of those sun rays and, and reflecting those rays uh, and their energy uh, and radiation back into the uh, into space. Um, these also can have important impacts because there's a lot of thermal inertia in these ice stores, and because of their volume, they can have an impact on sea level. Vegetation and soils make a big difference, so the texture of the land and the pattern of uh, wind across that land has a dynamic impact on our atmosphere and finally, the marine and terrestrial biospheres have a major impact on the atmosphere's composition. So there's an exchange, particularly if you think about something like forests, between the atmosphere and those, and those elements of the biosphere. So they play a really central role in our carbon cycle. And all of these systems are interacting physically, chemically, and biologically. They're all open and interactive systems. So what causes the climate to change? Um, this graphic just gives you some of the highlights. The greenhouse effect is essentially that large amounts of solar radiation come to the Earth. About half of that is reflected back away from the Earth by clouds in the atmosphere. About half passes through the atmosphere and is absorbed by the Earth's surface. Once it's absorbed, it's converted into heat energy and the uh, emission of infrared radiation back in the atmosphere comes then from the Earth. And some of that infrared radiation is absorbed and re-emitted by heat-trapping greenhouse gases. So the, sun ra uh, the solar radiation heats the planet, it's emitted as infrared radiation, and some of that then is picked up by these greenhouse gases. You see the sort of difficult to read, but I think instructive, illustration on the bottom of the slide, you can see the, the pink carbon dioxide 
peaks across the range of wavelengths and the blue water vapor wavelengths that are absorbed as they move through the atmosphere. What you see here is that both carbon dioxide and water absorb certain of the wavelengths. But importantly, there are places where water does not absorb the energy of the solar system and releases it back into space, but carbon dioxide does absorb that radiation. So you'll see what's called the water vapor window is kind of a trap door for heat to escape the planet in a kind of limited, controlled way. Carbon dioxide plays a role in narrowing that window of water vapor to escape the atmosphere. And so what's the effect of this? Well, over the last 150 plus years of the Industrial Revolution, we put a lot more carbon into the atmosphere as well as other uh, of the greenhouse gases. Some people will say that climate is always changing, and they're absolutely right. We know from the ice core data, that you can look back at least 800,000 years and see this kind of fluctuation of carbon dioxide levels and temperature levels that happen across those hundreds of thousands of years. I think it's notable to see that those are quite closely correlated, that the rise in carbon dioxide is often matched by the rise in temperature, almost entirely across this full map, with the exception of the very end of the map, where you can see the spike in carbon dioxide levels from, you know, in the 270s or up to 300 level at most over the last million years or more, to now reaching over 400. I think the number as of yesterday is 409 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The temperature system responds slowly to these changes. You can't see it on this map, but we haven't seen dramatic changes. We certainly haven't seen the same rise in temperature as we've seen in carbon dioxide. But that's because these systems take a long time for that heat to be essentially metabolized in the, in the atmosphere. So what we're looking at here is a real significant spike in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and temperature, which has risen about uh, one degree so far. And given the kind of tracking of these two variables across history, certainly is evidence for concern. You can also see a similar kind of process that's happening in the oceans. So these maps lay out the uh, average uh, temperatures. They vary also by season. So temperatures on the left and acidity levels on the right in different regions of the world. So essentially what you see is this gradual uh, creeping up of global ocean temperatures, variable across different locations, but in aggregate going up about half a degree or more now approaching one degree Fahrenheit, and the acidity levels in many parts of the ocean actually going down, meaning that the levels of acidity of the ocean are going up. That's a pH measure. So what's the importance of this to society? These are natural processes that have always been unfolding. There's some degree of dynamism or instability to them. Well, human action is one contributing factor to these. We know that agriculture. We know that our fossil fuel emissions from our automobiles and our transport systems, industrialization and deforestation are all contributors that have affected the chemistry of the atmosphere. And we know that there's now solid evidence that this is resulting in, in many places in the world, melting glaciers and ice caps, increases in storms. There is some debate about frequency, but there is little debate about the role of climate change in increasing the uh, intensity of storms. And then desertification, which is growing in many parts of the world. So a lot of people will talk about climate change as being a kind of threat multiplier. And I think this is an important idea. The idea is that climate change doesn't create, you know, all of the storms that we see but it makes the ones that we have that much more intense. It doesn't cause tropical disease, but it can facilitate the spread of those diseases much faster and much farther than would be otherwise. It doesn't cause war, but it can make those wars more likely. It doesn't cause drought, but it can make them more pervasive, uh, more frequent, and more prolonged. So this idea of climate change as a threat multiplier means that we need to understand it relative to all of the other category of risks that, that businesses and society face. So the carbon budget is an interesting idea. Um, scientists have 
been able to measure both the amount of carbon that's been emitted into the atmosphere and based on the best science, be able to determine how much more carbon the atmosphere can absorb and still stay within what the scientists agree would be a, a acceptable, although certainly impact degree increase, two degree Celsius increase in climate change. They've determined that we are currently about 60% over the course of the history of industrialization of our total allocation of carbon into the atmosphere, and that based on current projections of um, growth and emissions, our remaining carbon budget will be exhausted by the end of 2045 under a carbon-intensive trajectory. So if you see on the right side, you see the kind of radical turning down of the emissions, not only relative to the past, but in real terms, to be able to keep our climate in a relatively stable and livable condition. So I think this idea is very powerful because it captures the historical cumulative emissions that we're dealing with, not just the year-to-year -year changes in potentially decarbonizing from our, our previous state. So what do we do about this? John Holdren had an interesting quote. He said, we essentially have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering, and that we're going to do some of each of these things. And the question is, what is the mix going to be? And that's really up to us what the right mix should be. So I won't go through all of these, but I want to highlight the important differences between these elements. So essentially, mitigation means human interventions that reduce either the sources of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases or enhance the sinks of those gases. You can do things like price carbon, so essentially internalize that externality in the economy, reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are extracted, you can foster renew renewable energy, increase alternative fuels and transport systems, increase energy efficiency, and so forth. Those are all the things that you can do to try to limit the amount of climate change that happens. Adaptation, on the other hand, is what we need to do to be able to adjust our systems and our infrastructure to a climate changed world. That means changing our agricultural practices to more extreme temperatures, better managing wildfires, increasing efficiency in waste and water management. These are all things that don't necessarily have a direct impact on uh, mitigating climate change, but are important parts of the recipe for helping society to adjust to those things. There are some items which do both of those things. So building green infrastructure, planting mangroves on the coastline, both help to sequester carbon and be able to uh, capture some of the carbon in the atmosphere, but also make the shorelines more uh, resilient to the impacts of storms. So these kinds of things serve both a mitigation and an adaptation function. I should also mention geoengineering because it's very much in the press. This refers to deliberate large-scale interventions in the Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. For example, you could reflect part of the sun's rays back into space, or you might directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. There are many proposals for how to do this. They are um, completely untested. They are politically incredibly challenging, um, but I think that if they can't be taken off the table because of the urgency of the problem uh, of climate change, I think we need to be able to continue to explore through R&D and small-scale experimentation what kind of portfolio of geo geoengineering tools we might want to pursue as we get a better handle on the kind of challenge that we're facing around climate change. So as you can see, this is a really broad range of approaches that can be taken to address climate change. None of them are easy. None of them are enough alone. So over-reliance, thinking that renewable energy is going to solve the climate change problem, is really quite out of sync with what we know about the mathematics of carbon emissions. Um, so we need a, maybe not a silver bullet, but a silver buckshot approach that's holistic, that's systemic, and that takes these issues on with the urgency required. So let me talk a little bit about what companies should do to address climate change. We talked some about the climate system and about the drivers of climate change. We talked about what society's kind of portfolio of options are in front of them. How do companies engage with climate change? I think there are at least four ways that every company should be thinking about climate change. 
The first is that it is becoming uh, almost standard for every company to have a clear idea of how much carbon and other greenhouse gases are being emitted from their operations and how that is distributed across their supply chain. Many of you would be familiar with the differentiation between scope one emissions shown in the middle of this graphic, which are the direct emissions from your uh, operations, your vehicles, the things that you own directly. Scope two emissions are those things which are your indirect emissions related to, for example, the electricity that you buy or the steam or uh, heating and cooling that isn't your direct emissions, but indirectly you're responsible for those. Those require a different kind of measurement uh, as well as a different kind of, in of intervention. And then maybe most importantly and most uh, difficult are the scope three emissions, which are all of the upstream and downstream emissions that are associated with your business. So all of the suppliers and their products and services that they deliver to, to you, what's the footprint of those? as well as how your customers and um, distributors and others in your supply chain will use your product and emit carbon in the, in, in the process. So both upstream and downstream impacts are substantial, typically orders of magnitude more than your direct impacts, but ones that are really critical to be able to measure, to know where the most carbon intensive parts of your supply chain are, and to be able to then understand what are the risks and opportunities that come with addressing those things. So. In addition to measuring a uh, footprint, companies need to be setting goals for how much reduction in their carbon emissions they think they can achieve. And of course, there's lots of design choices here, whether those should be absolute or relative goals and how ambitious should those goals be. There's a lot of ways to answer that, but increasingly the answer is that the goal should be sufficiently ambitious that if that level of activity was generalized ac across the economy, we would be able to achieve our global goals in staying under a two degree Celsius uh, ceiling of climate change over the coming decades. And so there's a, a growing, mature, increasingly mature science of science-based targets that help to assess the level of ambition that companies should have to reduce their emissions, not just scope one, but also scope two and scope three. A third area that companies need to focus on is what is their strategy for disclosure of their carbon emissions. Now, there may be doubts about how much you want to share about this information, but increasingly investors, employees, and other stakeholders are demanding this information. So the question of disclosure is really a question about the level of communication and transparency that you want to have with your stakeholders. And finally, what are the mechanisms that you can use to accelerate action and investment on this issue. And of course, that's a big portfolio, but I'll highlight just one, which is carbon pricing. Many companies, um, maybe many of you on the, uh, on the line, have instituted a form of carbon pricing that even though there isn't a price broadly across the economy, because there hasn't been policy action to do that, um, companies are taking it on themselves to be able to define and implement a carbon price internally across their operations and see how that drives a different approach to their investment. So the World Economic Forum over the last several years has been identifying what are the global risks that companies are facing. And they take a very broad brush global approach to this, interviewing hundreds of people in different locations. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is this kind of emergence of several factors related to climate change that are moving to the top right of the, of the um, box diagram here meaning risks that are both increasingly likely and very significant impact on business. So if you look at the top right of this map, you can see that includes things like extreme weather events, natural disasters, as well as the social failure to be able to enact effective carbon mitigation and adaptation uh, policies. Water crises are not the same, but are clearly driven by the engine of climate change. So at least in the eyes of the World Economic Forum, which is not a, an environmental or particularly liberal or organization, a recognition that these factors are increasingly important parts of the risk of every business. A second kind of lens for thinking about this that I find quite compelling is from the Bank of England. Some of you may have seen Mark Carney's recent statements, the head of the Bank of England, 
on their approach to climate change, they've differentiated between three main categories of risk. Physical risks, liability risks, and transition risks. Physical risks are fairly obvious. It's having assets and uh, buildings and machinery in places where storms or drought or other impacts of climate change could materially impact your assets. So that's fairly straightforward. And of course, there's some debate about how fast climate change will unfold and how severe the consequences will be on what timeline. So physical risks are important, they're debated, and I think it's an important part of the overall mix. Interestingly though, liability risks are not about the physical risk per se. They're about the likelihood that a company could be held liable or accountable for not only their current emissions, but their historic emissions over time. So companies that are carbon intensive may be seen as accountable or responsible for addressing the kind of impacts that come from climate change. And we're seeing increasing number of lawsuits. The mayor of New York City, who's suing um, several companies now because of their contribution to climate change and their awareness of climate change without really taking sufficient action. And then the third category, maybe the most interesting, is transition risks. Transition risk is the risk of either a market shifting in ways that leave a company behind or a whole national economy failing to adapt to the changes that happen in the global economy and therefore face a situation where they become misaligned with the drivers of change in that economy may need to rapidly respond, often in a very disruptive way. So as we see increasing investment in renewables, and decarbonization of our auto sector, other elements of really industry transformation, economic transformation, it raises the prospect that companies that are left behind will face growing transition risks. So I think these are interesting because they are not all derivative of the physical science of climate change. They are more about the business exposure. Of course, there's an opportunity side. Climate change will require massive investment across the entire infrastructure of the world. This map shows the level of total investment required in coming decades, about $5 trillion a year but an incremental 0.7 trillion a year that will be need, uh, need to be invested in order to achieve the green growth kind of scenarios that we are striving for. What do those opportunities look for? Paul Hawken uh, published a book recently called Drawdown, where he maps out the most promising hundred uh, solutions to climate change. And this list is quite interesting because of some of the surprising elements. Changing refrigeration was the number one element on that list. So companies that may not have realized that they were really in the center of the climate change transition, in fact, have a huge role to play. Wind turbines, uh, which is maybe more uh, understood onshore, but reducing food waste, moving to a plant-rich diet, saving our tropical forests, educating girls. So this is not the usual suspects that you might hear about climate change and that I think open up a whole set of new opportunities for uh, companies as well as governments and individuals to think about ways of capturing value from these investments. Investors are increasingly orienting to this. The Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, headed by Michael Bloomberg, recently published their recommendations demonstrating the kind of expectations that investors have for not only the carbon footprint of the company, but the scenarios of the future and how robust the assets and strategies of the company are, given a range of scenarios that we see in the future. Many of you may be familiar also with the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is establishing guidance for the SEC to evaluate companies on the issues that are most material um, to that industry. So definitely increasing investor interest in this issue. In business leadership, you know many of the folks that have been taking leadership on this issue over the recent past, people like Paul Pullman at Unilever. Increasingly, we're seeing oil and gas companies champion this issue in important ways. We do work with a company recently called Statoil that changed its name to Equinor to recognize the kind of transition that the economy is going through that doesn't mean that they're getting out of the oil and gas business. It only means that they're transitioning as the world transitions to evolve toward a different kind of energy mix. So quickly, I would like to go through a few quick strategies that I think might be helpful to help you rethink 
your approach to climate change. I think this is the most exciting, most important, most urgent challenge that the world faces, one that has great risk, but also enormous opportunities for value creation and wealth creation. And I think one of the keys is to be able to think differently about this issue than what your peers or, or your uh, government officials are thinking. So these are some just uh, simple heuristics that can maybe set you down a path to come up with creative approaches to climate change. First of all is approaching the problem outside in. So I mentioned when I worked on the water issue, we had the luxury to look at kind of the broad range of issues related to water, not only operational issues, but issues of watershed management, of water policy, of water economics, of water and health. And only by approaching the problem in all its dimensions did we then identify a whole set of new ways for the company to get engaged in being part of the solution to preserving healthy watersheds, being part of the solution to uh, waterborne illness in the developing world. In the same way, I see Novozymes as being a company that's doing some really interesting work, taking the sustainable development goals as the kind of ultimate statement of global needs and working back to how their business might address some of those global challenges. In the area of climate change, they had looked through the over almost 200 national level development goals that have been set by countries around the world related to their climate goals and said, how might our enzymes be useful in addressing some of the goals that the countries have in addressing climate change? On that basis, they were able to identify several new opportunities that were not obvious to their marketers, but which allowed them to pursue big new pools of value creation that they weren't um, tracking um, before. So approaching the problem outside in is the first heuristic. Second is you need to get up close and personal with the problem. Many of you may know about Ray Anderson uh, or Lee Scott at Walmart. Their convictions around sustainability and sustainable business were driven by their personal experience uh, in the field, seeing the way that climate change and environmental issues are playing out in locations around the world. And the reason to do that is, one, it can create new insights. I show the on the upper right a kind of ingenious water wheel that was created when people spent time with women carrying water in uh, villages in India, allowing them to transport much more water faster and with much less physical impact. But also a failure to apprentice with the problem means that you can get yourself coming up with solutions that don't actually work in the real world. And so both for insight as well as for avoiding oversight, I think apprenticing with the problem is really critical. Number three, many of you are familiar with problem solving. Many of you were trained as engineers that were taught extensive techniques and methods for problem solving. We need those problems, those problem solving techniques, don't get me wrong. But what we are much less good at is problem finding. You see Russell Acaw's quote, we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. So how do you go through a process of really creatively redefining and refinding, reframing um, problems that give you new traction on these issues? We work with the Oxford Global Challenge, uh, which is an organization that offers a challenge to students not so much to solve problems, but to come up with creative reframing of those problems. So again, spend more time on the problem finding rather than just the problem solving. Number four, think in systems. And I'll just give one example here. Ingersoll Rand, uh, many of you may be familiar with. Of course, when they look at their climate impacts and their climate goals, it's obvious that uh, it makes sense for them to set science-based targets for reducing their footprint. And their first goal is to reduce their uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 35 percent by 2020. But in addition to that, they said, look, we have a portfolio of products that can help mitigate climate change, and we want to increase sales of those products in the marketplace. That's good for the business, but it's also good for increasing the effectiveness of global mitigation of climate change. And finally, they're investing so that their future portfolio will reflect a commitment to this issue and finding new solutions driven by new technologies to these issues. So I think this is a really good example of thinking beyond just the basic kind of table stakes of footprint and really thinking creatively and systemically 
about where the opportunities lie for the company. Number four, apply forward reasoning. All of us know about uh, you know certification schemes and eco labels, which incent companies to drive performance at the high end. We also know that regulation is often used to raise the bottom for the ones that are the most egregious sort of problems in you know causing pollution or other kinds of problems. Uh, in this case, deforestation. You actually need an integrated approach that can ratchet over time, where you have both a top-down approach driven by positive incentives, as well as a bottom-up, more regulatory approach, and that those can work together to trigger stickier interventions that lead to progressive incremental trajectories that you entrench support over time and you expand the populations that are covered. So in the case of deforestation, we certainly have not solved this problem, but we're building a kind of array of ways of lifting the bottom, incenting the top, and ratcheting the middle so that we can uh, make progress on this truly global um, challenge. Number six, leveraging exponential technology. So the same things that companies are interested in terms of AI and predictive analytics are also very relevant to addressing the climate change problem. A new company that was formed in uh, 2017 called Jupiter is using predictive analytics to allow for very fine-grained local predictions of water, temperature, and other ecological conditions for farming and for infrastructure planning that can be done in a much more finely nuanced way than has ever been done before. The CEO uh, is a former uh, colleague of Bill Gates and Elon Musk, and they've been able to bring in some of the best climate scientists as well as information technology experts to create a new platform for much more nuanced kind of uh, risk predictive analytics. So again, leveraging the best of technology to solve this problem is an area of great opportunity. Stress test in different scenarios. So recently Chevron released uh, their report on climate change resilience, where they went through the whole uh, range of their strategies for success and applied those strategies across three contexts laid out by the International Energy Agency, saying current policy scenario, new policy scenario, and sustainable development scenario, how robust would Chevron's strategy be across this really wide range of different scenarios? The real test of scenario planning is whether your strategies are robust across a really wide range of possible scenarios of the future. So driven partly by the recommendations on risk disclosure and a growing awareness that we don't know how this issue will play out either physically or in a policy sense, or a societal sense, how do you test the strategies of your company across a range of really different scenarios? So I think this is a really important part of the skill set. Number eight, I won't go into detail here, but design thinking is a methodology that I think uh, brings a whole set of really useful creative tools to solving problems like climate change. Uh, I was recently at a UVA event on uh, innovation in climate change where we use design thinking methodologies to unlock ideas for uh, new entrepreneurial businesses in the space, and I found it really powerful. So this is just a kind of a template of the kind of tools that are available. That's a whole nother talk, but I encourage you to dig into the uh, design kit published by IDEO listed at the bottom of the slide. And then finally, recognize that the solution to convincing people of the importance of climate change often is the problem. What do I mean by that? Some interesting research done at uh, Duke University in the last couple of years assessed both Democrats and Republicans relative to their, um, uh, their belief in climate change, the extent to which they believe that humans are causing climate change. What they found, not surprisingly, more Democrats agreed with that statement than Republicans. However, if you were put in two different conditions, one where the solutions that were identified to take on climate change were market-oriented, they were capitalist solutions to driving action on climate change, Republicans were quite open to that possibility. However, if the solution required a serious government intervention on the issue, they were much less likely to say that they believed that humans were causing climate change. In other words, people may not be responding so much to the problem as much as to the implied solution of climate change. And in fact, this works in the opposite way as well. 
Democrats uh, are slightly less likely to believe that humans cause climate change if the solutions required are, are market positive solutions. So this is not only a Republican issue, it's an issue that all of us have that we respond not only to the problem, but also to the, the degree to which we like or find averse the solutions that are being proposed to address the problem. So just a little insight into the psychology of addressing climate change that might be helpful. I'm going to wrap up here with a couple quick thoughts. We know that we have several urgent development priorities, providing energy, water, food, health, and education to the world's populations, which are certainly unfinished business. We also know that there's an ecological ceiling beyond which we can't go without degrading the system and undermining our ability to achieve those goals for human development. So Kate Rayworth is a scholar who's uh, laid out a model that she calls the donut theory of well-being, that there's a safe and just space that is in between the social foundation of providing for the world's population and doing so with an awareness of the ecological limits or the planetary boundaries that we're functioning within and learning how we articulate our economy and our policies in ways that create this just and safe space for humanity should be what our policy goal is. So I think just a good way of conceptualizing, we're not only trying to solve climate change, we're trying to do it in a way that's compatible with meeting the world's needs. Five quick questions. Where do I think climate change discussions will go? I don't know, but places to look. One is, how will this play out by location? Number two, what kind of new industries will emerge and evolve over time? Three, we have a delayed start in addressing climate change by any measure. So what's the consequence of that? And how fast will we be able to reshape our economy to address climate change or face disruptive uh, transitions? Number four, I think some of the risks and opportunities are obvious, but the business insight is where those risks and opportunities are hidden. Um, beyond the obvious and ones that you can take action on. So I encourage you to look for where those hidden risks and opportunities are. And finally, what's the future of climate information? As more and more of the world knows about climate change, has the data about where we are and where we're going, what kind of accountability will companies, individuals, and governments have in the future as that kind of information becomes much more visible and understandable to the general public? So I'd like to just conclude with a quote we live in interesting times. We're at this really unique window that we're the first generation to feel the effects of climate change. It's happening now. And we're the last generation who can do something about it. So our call to action is urgent and inspiring. And I welcome you to engage with me, thinking about the science, about the range of solutions that are possible, and about where we go to take on this wicked problem in a new way. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh for bringing this complex subject in pieces that we can actually manage. So let me start with a few questions for you. So when we're talking about climate change, um, which are the sectors of the economy that will be impacted the most by this issue? Yeah, so I think it's different depending on the category of risk that you're talking about. We talked earlier about the Bank of England's um, taxonomy of physical liability and transition risks. In terms of physical risks, I think food and agriculture is particularly vulnerable. We're already seeing significant changes in fisheries, in wine, in cocoa, in uh, optimal growing uh, locations for uh, key crops. And so I think food and agriculture, uh, and this is actually, uh, uh, I think, a sector that gets this and is taking action. So I think they are responding because they see how relevant and how fundamental these issues are to their business. I also think construction and infrastructure need to be thinking about what we do around coastal development, the extent to which we build on coastlines, the ways we manage floods. So those are some industries that I think are really uh, most relevant in terms of the physical risks. Liability risks, uh, a recent study identified 90 of the top uh, corporate emitters that account for about 63% of the total cumulative global greenhouse gas emissions. So those are uh, in oil and gas, they're in um, cement, in the cement industry. They range from investor-owned firms to state-owned companies to government-run industries. 
But certainly those companies, I think, are aware. So there was a recent briefing that uh, Chevron and some of the other uh, companies gave to a judge around the proceedings to evaluate the accountability of these companies for climate change. I'm not arguing that they should be accountable. I am arguing that these companies should be aware of their vulnerability to liability risks. And then finally, I think transition risks. We saw with the coal industry a really rapid loss of their market value as the economy pivoted with the increased affordability of renewables. Likewise, I think automakers, uh, financial services, these are industries that I think would be uh, affected if, and indeed, I think we are seeing a rapid transition in not only the energy mix, but the nature of the economy itself. I heard a recent um, statistic that, you know, we've been debating the clean power plan that uh, was Obama's way of approaching climate change. It set 2030 goals that has now been um, put on ice by the Trump administration. Nevertheless, the U.S. is about 80 percent toward its 2030 goals, uh, as stated in the clean power plan. So even though we don't have the policy instrument in place, the rapid progress is mind boggling. So we're living through that revolution, whether we know it or not. And so you were talking about mitigation, adaptation and geoengineering. So those are all those potential ways to address climate change. But in particular, when it comes to geoengineering solutions, um, how will they be able to manage climate change? Yeah, so I think geoengineering, um, you know, it's a relatively recent uh, conversation. And I would say that I'm not philosophically opposed to, uh, to geoengineering approaches. But I think, and I think that we should invest heavily in all of our portfolios, mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering. So I'm not against that. However, these approaches will be extremely hard to implement. Think about this. Who has the right or the power to optimize the global uh, climate for their benefit? There are always winners and lo losers with any change. So as the climate warms, there are some places that will benefit. Canada and Russia, for example, in the short term, may benefit by a warming climate. So any, any attempt to adjust the global climate has both winners and losers, which means that inherently a uh, geoengineering solution that has global impact on the climate will be incredibly politically contentious. Inevitably, there will also be unintended side effects and that these will uh, be very difficult or maybe even impossible to reverse. Geoengineering often also will solve part of the problem, but not in a systemic way. So even if we did geoengineering, reflected sun's rays back out uh, uh, to the uh, out of the atmosphere into space, that doesn't affect the ocean acidification, which is happening because of the increased concentrations of, of carbon. So we may be able to address the, the climate uh, aspect or the temperature aspect of climate change, but not the ocean acidification side effect. And finally, I think that geoengineering, it's untested, it's politically contentious, and it's highly risky, um, and it doesn't provide a holistic solution. So I deeply discount this as at least a, a, a savior for us with climate change. I think it's important we invest and explore, but I think we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to accelerate and amplify and implement the uh, mitigation and adaptation portfolios as quickly and as extensively as possible. Thank you. And when it comes to science, uh, science shouldn't be polarizing. However, we all know that the science on climate change it has been highly polarized. And in such a divided uh, society that we live today, what is that unifying message or factor that you would like people out there to keep with them as they think about addressing climate change? Yeah, I have several thoughts about that because it's a conversation that I have uh, often. Let me say that I like to speak to business audiences about climate change because it decenters the conversation um, from a debate between my beliefs and your beliefs, whether climate change should be a, an element of belief or not is a whole nother question. I think the important question for a business is not whether you believe in climate change, but based on a level-headed assessment 
of the risks and opportunities that your business faces given all of the aspects of climate change. What do I mean by that? So every company will have some level of exposure around physical risks related to the climate. Now, that's probably the one that's most variable, because if you don't believe that this problem is accelerating or that climate change, that cli the climate is becoming more unstable, uh, you may discount that. And that's fine. Um, but I think you have to be aware of the bands of possibility that we are now seeing where the amount of damages year on year uh, that our society is paying for climate-related uh, impacts is growing. So, for example, 2017, with the three big storms, over $200 billion uh, in damage. So I think it's uh, incumbent on somebody who works for a business to say, how do we make sure that we are as prepared as possible for whatever physical risks we face? Second of all, what liability risks do we face? That's not a question about whether you believe in climate change. That's a question about whether you have legal accountability if somebody were to take you to task for your contribution to climate change. It's really irrelevant what your belief is at that point. It's really a question of your assessment of how exposed is the company to those liability risks. And then finally, I think it's very clear that our economy is transitioning quickly uh, and in a direction where decarbonization is really fundamental. So as our economy transitions, how exposed is your company to those transition risks? And the flip side, where are there opportunities for your company to invest to capture some of the value that will be created as the economy goes through those transitions? What you don't want to do is keep your heels dug into the sand because of your own beliefs and allow for the economy to shift so far away from your current strategy that there's either no way back or if you do make it back, it's highly disruptive and value destroying. So I guess I would uh, encourage anyone who's with a company to say your own personal views about this may be secondary to your clear-headed assessment of the risks and opportunities that your company faces about it. I could speak a lot more to the, let me just add one more thing to it. Let's take the whole climate sort of global warming temperature element out of the equation. Let's only focus on ocean acidification. I would ask a series of questions. One is, do you believe that humans release carbon dioxide when they burn fossil fuels? Do you agree with that? Number two, do you believe that the concentrations of greenhouse gases are increasing in the atmosphere? That's measurable. Number three, uh, do you believe that oceans are a sink for that carbon and that they're absorbing that increased concentration of carbon? That's also measurable. Uh, and so over time, the chemistry of the ocean is becoming more acidic. Healthy oceans are critical for biodiversity. Over 2 million species are in the ocean, over 90% of which we don't actually know uh, what they are. Uh, protein sources. The ocean is the largest source of protein for human consumption, and it produces about half of the world's uh, oxygen. So let's set aside the debates around temperature and models and say, it looks to me like the mechanism for ocean acidification is pretty straightforward. That's a big problem. It's driven by carbon emissions. The solutions to that problem are the same portfolio that you would take generally for climate change. And I think even if the only issue were ocean acidification, it merits a very serious, very focused kind of uh, effort to drive down our emissions. So for lots of good reasons, I think we can move in a direction that is no regrets, that is positive in driving economic growth and prosperity, and which leads us to a place that has a stable climate and a prosperous society. So I think that's the goal that we should all shoot for. There are lots of debates to be had around the science, the science uh, of how fast uh, climate change is moving and exactly how it will be expressed is still under debate, as science should be. But I think we know the broad outlines and we can see the mandate even to address things like ocean acidification that really require urgent action. So I hope that helps to create some common ground with people who may be skeptical of some parts of the scientific record. but understand the value that this might have for their company. Thank you, Dan. Very much appreciated uh, bringing this wicked problem forward to us. For everybody, do inform yourself. We're going to put additional resources for you to go deeper 
because is the future of our generation is not a part of debate, but taking action and looking at the opportunities and not at being right, but solving the world challenges. So tune in for the next lectures and until the next one.